Hi, my name is Dr. Gail Hecht. I'm Professor of Medicine and Microbiology and Immunology, as well as Chief of Gastroenterology and Nutrition at Loyola University Medical Center in Maywood, Illinois. I'm also past president of the AGA. I'm here today to talk a bit about the gut microbiome. We're just beginning to understand the definition or the composition of the gut microbiota. And the science right now is at a very early stage whereby only associations between certain compositions of bacterial populations and health and or disease are being realized. What's lacking, however, are mechanisms of action, how the gut microbiota might actually contribute to disease. We do know that altered or dysregulated a gut microbiome is associated with a number of diseases, including diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, cancer, allergic disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and even heart disease. The question is, how can this be? The gut microbiota can cause disease primarily by alterations in metabolism. For example, ingestion of foods containing phosphatidylcholine or ingestion of a diet high in red meat that we see in the Western Hemisphere contains uh, a large abundance of the nutrient L-carnitine. Both choline and L-carnitine are broken down by the gut microbiota to um, a molecule called trimethylamine. The liver oxidizes TMA into TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, which is known to accelerate the development of atherosclerosis. In that way, bacteria housed in the gut are actually contributing to the development of heart disease. It's interesting that in 370 BC, Hippocrates was quoted as saying, all diseases begin in the gut. In fact, he may have been right. We're realizing the therapeutic potential of the gut, gut microbiome largely through the use of fecal microbial transplantation. We know that by restoring the healthy human gut microbiome to individuals with recurrent C. difficile disease, that a normal microbiome or microbiota population can be reestablished, thereby ridding C. difficile and clearing the infection. With that potential, therapeutic value, however, comes risk that we must be cognizant of. In patients who require fecal transplantation, it's important to proceed with that type of therapy. In those who perhaps don't require that right off the bat, it's important to know that we're unaware at this point of the long-term uh, sequelae of fecal microbial transplantation. With the realization that various compositions of the fecal microbiome seem to be associated with disease, again, we need to be cautious in changing or altering that microbiome in a host because 10, 20, 30 years later, we may realize that we've created yet another problem. The analogy would be transfusion of blood products before we understood those products were transmitting hepatitis C in some cases. If a patient needs a blood transfusion, of course they were given that, but little be known to them, they were also receiving an inoculum of the hepatitis C virus. When we perform fecal microbial transplantation from one host to the next, we're also transmitting viruses, fungi, and bacteriophage. We don't understand today the long-term impact of those changes to a particular individual. Therefore, caution has to be used in uh, administering FMT. This is a very rapidly moving field. Much of the science is coming from the basic science world and is very complex, complex technology, complex uh, metabolomics. But to the practitioner, I think it's important to at least pay attention to some of these areas because I can envision in the next decade, perhaps, that we will be incorporating some of these strategies into our daily practice. Again, that could be as simple uh, as altering diet and, and combining dietary alterations with some of our pharmaceutical approaches.